I'm reading an interesting book these days. It's entitled, The Kingdom, The Power, and the Glory. American Evangelicals in an Age of Extremism. It's written by Tim Alberta. It's an illuminating read that helps to tell the story of how the evangelical church has transformed over the decades. Telling the early stories of people like the Reverend Jerry Falwell of Thomas Road Baptist Church and Liberty University. And helping to tell the modern stories of movements such as the Faith and Freedom Coalition. Now, Alberta is a son of a pastor. He was raised as an evangelical in Michigan, helps to shape the narrative of how Christianity and politics in particular have merged over the years to what some might describe in today's headlines as Christian nationalism. And one of the takeaways from these stories is how one of the sins of modern day evangelical movement is the idol worship for America versus the worship of our God in Jesus Christ. The fight for the soul of the Christian church is nothing new. Throughout history, one can find evidence of empires, national governments, military leaders, politicians, and dictators weaponizing religion for militaristic and personal agendas. We can even go back about 500 years to the founding of the Reformation as theologians like Martin Luther and John Calvin were decrying the idol worship of the then Catholic Church who had lost sight of what the Reformers considered the most important aspects of Christianity. And from these arguments, the Reformers articulate over the years what's now summarized as what's called the five solas. These are the five themes of the Reformed theology that help to articulate the core principles of Christianity. And I'll do my best here to briefly and quickly summarize these five solas here. The first, you can write these down in your bulletins if you want to take some notes home to share with your friends and family. The first is sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. There's only one primary source of inspiration and authority for the church, and that is Scripture, the Reformers said. The Reformers called the church back to the text in light of generations veering away from the Word of God, many people at the time never having read a word directly from the Bible for themselves, instead relying on the interpretation from other church leaders. The second is sola fide, meaning faith alone. Martin Luther would state that faith is the most important aspect, having the church reorient herself as the basis of reconciliation between God and humanity begins with faith, he said, and not some formula or set of behaviors. The third, sola gratia, meaning grace alone. There is nothing that we can do as sinful humans to warrant God's favor. It's only in grace that we experience God made whole and holy, and in grace that we can serve as the church. The fourth, solus Christus, Christ alone. It is Christ alone who is enough, the head of the church. We don't need any other actions, steps, or intermediaries between us. In the fifth, soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. This fifth sola helps to encompass the previous four as the church is called to both recognize and celebrate God's glory in all things from beginning to end, including the lives we lead. So I share this with us now to demonstrate that what we as Christians and even as Americans in 2024 are experiencing is really not anything new. Yes, the details of the arguments, the, the tactics and the medium changes. But to be honest, ever since the days of Jesus himself with his resurrection, people have been discussing, 
posturing and arguing about the essentials of what we now call Christianity and how our lives of faith intersect with our daily living. And these friends are really important conversations to be shared. And so today I'd like for us to further reflect on these important conversations with the beginning of this sermon series on the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians. I hope that the next few weeks help us to dig deeper into the intricacies of not only Paul's beliefs about God and Jesus, we use this word theology, but I also hope that this series invites us individually and collectively to dig deeper into what we personally believe about who Jesus is and what does it mean to follow him as a disciple, as a Christian today. And today we do so by reflecting on the opening chapter of Paul's letters to the Galatians and focusing on a term we often use quite nonchalantly these days. The word is gospel. And so what is the gospel? How do we define it? If you were to write alongside those five solas you wrote in your bulletin this morning, what is the gospel? I wonder what words we might use. Why is it so important for us to clearly define the gospel in today's world? So let's get again to these opening chapter here of Paul's letter as we think about this word for us today. Again, we're reading again from this opening chapter of Galatians. Today we're reflecting on what we're calling chapter 1. Back in the day, though, before the chapters were included, this would be the opening greeting, the thanksgiving, and the beginning of the body of Paul's letter here. A few study notes for us today. If you weren't in last Tuesday's Bible study, Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians, which is part of the Roman Empire back then in modern-day Turkey, if you're trying to get your geography straight. Sometimes uh, around the late 40s or the early 50s, so just about a decade or so following um, uh, uh, Christ's death and resurrection. Much of the historical context that we know about this letter and Paul's travels to Galatia is actually found in the book of Acts, which some of us have reflected on a few months back in our sermon series. And so it's interesting to compare and contrast these writings when thinking about topics of timeline, of location, of characters, etc., etc. And we read that Paul has a history with these churches in Galatia. He most likely helped to establish these faith communities perhaps years before. And so when we read this letter, we also understand that there have been others who have made their presence known since Paul's time with the Galatians, teaching practices, in particular this expectation of circumcision, that go against the teaching of Paul's gospel. Thus the phrase he uses, a different gospel. We see that in verse 6. And so in many of Paul's letters, he begins with warm words of thanksgiving for being such faithful community members. Here, however, Paul minces no words. There are no words of thanksgiving. Perhaps just the opposite. In short, Paul writes that if anyone, including himself, teaches anything contrary to the gospel, which was previously taught by him, then they are flat out wrong, he says in verse 9. And throughout this letter, there are small but yet precise statements that we would be benefited to identify and process. In verse 10, for example, Paul articulates that his authority is not from his own admittedly big personality, but from God. In fact, he says his life could not be, he, his life could have been a lot easier if he decided to pursue pleasing others instead of living a life of faith. But no, the gospel share, he shares with the Galatians and with us today was directly revealed to him by Christ himself, as we remember from the story of his conversion on the way to Damascus, found again in the book of Acts. And he, again, so in verse 10 he says, am I now seeking human approval or God's approval, or am I trying to please people? If, we're, if I were so pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ, for I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And Paul then shares his story. He, he shares what we call a testimony to the Galatians of how God not only called him, but sent him as a missionary to not only the Jewish people from which he was raised and educated, but also perhaps particularly to the Gentiles, those outside of the traditional church. He eloquently shares with the Galatians that such a calling is not of human ambition or zeal like his previous life. No, Paul's life was literally changed in God's grace. Again, verse 15. The one who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace. Now at this point, it's understandable that we are left with perhaps more questions than answers. We may wonder about Paul's personality, about his, his confidence, bordering on cockiness, I understand, that he communicates with his church community in this letter. We might wonder why the issue of people being circumcised is really such a big deal after all. Don't we uh, today use the term, live your truth as an adage indiscriminately to anyone living their lives today? If, if someone wants to go off and get circumcised, more power to them. And we may also be wondering, well, again, what is the gospel that he's referring to anyways? And why does it matter so much? And these are natural questions. And to begin to respond to them, we still need to read the entirety of the letter, which we will do so in the coming weeks. But for our purposes today, I think we actually get a wonderfully written clue here in Paul's opening remarks once again. If we go back to verses 3 and 4, it helps to articulate just what exactly the gospel that Paul is trying to communicate is. As he writes these words, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a brief and perhaps overlooked statements in this longer letter as many of us are prone to do we oftentimes skim through the opening words of a letter looking for instead the the substance the the meat of a reason why someone is writing all these words paul will provide us with more meat in the coming weeks as with the following chapters but right here in this inside opening sentence tucked uh, paul shares a summary of the very gospel that he is ardently seeking to uplift and with it, the good news for us today. The gospel of Jesus Christ frees us from the bondage of this world so that we might live our lives as expressions of God's grace. Put another way, using Paul's own words as well, by God's grace... Because of Jesus dying on the cross and ultimately being risen from death itself, we are liberated to live as new creations. There's nothing else needed. No circumcision. No purity laws. No special offerings. No priests. Jesus is enough. And Jesus, in Paul's words, is everything. Solus Christus. Christ alone is the gospel. The ramifications of this good news is nothing short of life-changing for Paul, and for the Galatians, and for us today. We're reminded that no matter what happens in this world, Christ alone is the gospel. When people start acting as if the fate of the world hinges on the next election of one political party over the other, Christ alone 
When there is war and terror on all sides and we feel helpless of what to do about it or what to say about it, Christ alone. When we wonder if there is any one decision or program or pastor that will guide the trajectory for First Presbyterian in the days ahead, remember, friends, Christ alone. When people ask us why we are a Christian, when people ask us what we put faith into these days, it is Christ alone. Today, as we gather around this table, as we share the story of God's covenant with us never to abandon us, and we tell the story of Jesus on the cross, we're reminded that through the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the cup, we proclaim Christ alone as the hope of the world. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we today give all thanks and praise. Alleluia. Amen.